Okay, so we're gonna call me in order at 6.07. Um, additions or deletions to the agenda from anybody? Who's running the meeting, Bill, you or Matt? I have the uh, hosting responsibilities. Okay. And then um, for members of the public, members of staff, again, we just have a note that um, any you can speak to any topic, four minutes maximum. Action may not be able to be taken immediately and written correspondence prior to a board meeting allows the board to be prepared. Um, if you are dialing in, um, you have um, star six to mute and unmute and star nine to raise your hand. Um, is there any comments from the public? How many people do we have all together, Bill? Uh, we have uh, five rows of five. So we have a total of 25 right now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any blue hands in the digital world. How about members of the staff next? Okay. Re review and approve the minutes of the December 21st, 2020 meeting. I'll move that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Mark. Do I have a second? Kate seconds. Okay, so we have a motion by Mark and a second by Kate. Mark, you got any corrections? Um, I do. I've got three, three of them. Go ahead. Start on which page, Mark, and then what the correction yep. is. Uh, page one, middle of the page. Uh, it's small, but additions or deletions to the agenda, then members of the public should be on a separate line. Then on page two, under the waiting study update, second paragraph, um, at, towards the end it says, um, uh, where is it? Uh, it says a Dwight reported. Um, I believe that was Rick, not Dwight. And the line below that, um, uh, sorry, it's Mr. Martin asked, um, you referenced the um, abbreviation FRL. I think that should just be spelled out. I don't remember what it was. So if I don't remember, I'm sure other people don't. Free and reduced lunch. I knew it had something to do with lunches. And There's I, no free lunches. I think that was it. Okay. Um, Kate, you had any corrections or comments, additions? No corrections or comments. Okay, anybody else? Peter, are you all good with his corrections? That far. Okay, you guys, if uh, there's no other discussion, if you're all ready to vote, all those in favor, please signify so by saying aye. 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 Appears as though the ayes have it. Aye. Whoops. Oh, Laura, I didn't see you there. I can't see you there. Um, the eyes have it. Moving on, correspondence. I have no correspondence. Bill, Matt, or Tammy, any correspondence for us that I missed? Nope, no correspondence from the administration. Everybody's shaking their head. This is interesting. First thing in their old business. Matt and Tammy, update on January 4th, January 8th, in-person instruction. Um, how'd it go last week, guys? Not good, I take it, from what Matt's going to tell us. Part went fine. <clears throat> um, we did uh, result in a positive COVID case at school, not related to school. Um, that we are managing today, have been managing since about 10 o'clock last night. Um, and the latest is that uh, we will be directed, we have been directed by the Department of Health to shift to remote learning for the cohort group, which is grades K through three. 
And so that will begin tomorrow and will run until, um, technically it'll run until the 22nd. However, we have no school on the 25th and 26th. Wednesday is remote, so we'll be back to remote on Wednesday, back to in-person on Thursday the 28th for those grades. Anybody have any questions for Matt? Go ahead, Mark. Um, can you tell us whether it was a student or faculty staff? <clears throat> um, the way we've put the publicity out to the families is that it's a member of our learning community. Okay. Which does narrow it to either student or staff. Yes, it, it truly narrows it down. Thank you. Given our small numbers, I would rather protect the privacy as, as well as I can of the individual and the family. That's why I asked, can you tell us? So I appreciate that. Hey, um, Tammy. Oh, Elaine, I'll, I'll get to you right after I got I called Tammy first and we'll get to you second. So we had a pretty typical week back from school. Um, we did have 24 uh, students learning in person, which we reported in our principal report and then 23 students learning remotely and that includes um, our pre-kk which we had planned on being remote uh, it includes those students that were learning remotely and it also includes those students who um, needed to comply with the governor's orders as far as quarantining so we were about half in person and half out for last week okay thank thank you Tammy um, Elena, I hope you're not outside because you don't look like you're dressed for it. Oh. <laughs> no, that's just my Zoom background. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, I was just wondering, that I, I guess that this is all happening quickly, so I apologize for not being um, to um, have not having digested all of this yet, but just uh, some a clarification about the um, quarantine for the cohort. Um, I guess I was wondering if the, if the communication didn't provide an option for those who are not in the grade two where the infected individual is, um, but for you know the the rest of the the larger group, the cohort. Um, my, I guess I have a few questions. One is, is there an option for quarantine for? Uh, a, a negative COVID test, or is it only the option of full quarantine? Like, could the students who are now going to be remote starting tomorrow to get a, a COVID test and then come back after um, a seven-day quarantine period? Um, is is that something that was considered? Is that an option? And and then um, also, I was wondering. I know that the I don't really know exactly what cohort means, but I I, I recognize from the instruction that. For those who aren't in the classroom, um, I think the, the extended group includes those who are in outdoor recess. And I guess, you know, outdoor recess, they still wear masks, but I guess the guidance was that they all still, even though the grades don't play with each other, they have their kind of squared off areas. Um, they, but, you know, I guess I was asking, asking for more clarification around kind of like the larger quarantine for the other grades apart from grade two. So Matt, is that something you want to answer, Bill? Imagine the Department of Health told you know gave you the what to do or gave you instructions, and that's what we're following, correct? Yeah, I'll let Matt answer this. Um, we have found that um, having the superintendent designate the principal on the ground uh, to be in direct con uh, communication with the VDH has worked in our other schools, and so that's what we did in this case. So I would ask Matt to go ahead and share. Yes, absolutely. So Elena, back in November, the um, separation of the groups in outdoor play was rescinded as was the exterior um, use of masks. So those things have been, um, you know, kids have been, although they're still required to maintain their distance, uh, they have been playing together and they have been not wearing masks when they're outside and they're six feet away. 
That said, many children still choose to wear masks. It's cold. Um, one of the teachers here referred to it as her face blanket, which I thought was pretty cute. Um, anyway, most, I would say more than half the children wear masks anyway outside. It's more comfortable for them. There's no problems with it. Um, because of the change in plan in November, the Department of Health um, representative I've been working with recommended that we, we um, recognize this larger group in this case based on the facts that the uh, mask requirement and the um, cohort mixing had been lifted back in November. Uh, as she said, uh, you know, the, the catchphrase, out of an abundance of caution. In terms of your other question, Elena, about coming back after seven days and a negative test, that's always the protocol for quarantine. Quarantine is 14 days by default, but it can be ended by a negative result after a test that has been conducted um, no sooner than seven days since the date that is established as the date of exposure. So you're right on with that. Um, at, we may be able to do something sooner than the 28th, and that will evolve over the next few days. If we can, we absolutely will. Some of it will depend on the teacher's availability as well, in terms of how quickly she can be tested and the adults getting back in the game as well. So um, because there's so many balls in the air, uh, the best bet at this point was to just put the, so to speak, worst case scenario out there as the 28th. Um, start preparing for that. And then if we get good news and things go better than planned, there is the potential for us to start sooner depending on how all the test results come out. And it's, it's complicated, as you can imagine. It's a lot of kids. There'll be a lot of test results to juggle. Um, so we may not be able to do sooner than two weeks, but um, it's not off the table. Let's just say is that fair enough. Yeah, thank you. That's super helpful. And the official date is the Friday the 7th, right? Um, or is that? Friday the 8th. Friday the 8th, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So if the parents can help by even like scheduling our own um, or planning for that, um, it would be the seven days from that date. Right. So on the 15th, uh, folks are able to take a test to be to schedule and receive a PCR test. Um, it must be the standard PCR. It may not be the rapid right. response that doesn't qualify. Sure. And um, those results are typically within a couple or three days. So potentially if everybody got tested on the, eight, on the 15th and they got the results on Sunday, we could be back on the 18th. I don't believe that we'll be able to manage all of the moving parts by then but we'll be, we'll be looking at all options to try to get back absolutely as quickly as possible. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, just to follow up on that, um, first of all, Elena, thank you for the question because it does help us clarify um, that uh, Monday is a holiday. So uh, students would not be in school on the 18th. Uh, Wednesday is a planned remote day on the 20th. So just to keep those things in mind as well. Um, I'm sorry, um, Tammy, I think we covered you, Mark, and is there anybody after Mark? Go ahead, Mark. So um, I just want to say thank you to Matt and the administration for handling this. It sounds like the protocols that you had in place prior to this occurring um, were full and were followed and, um, and everything's going as it could. You know, I think everybody expected that there would be some positive tests throughout the year. Um, so I just want to compliment you on handling it well. So thank you. Okay. Um, Matt, when you went to principal school, was that right on top of your one of your first classes, how to manage a pandemic? Yeah, it absolutely was. <laughs> okay. Um, Matt, Oh, uh, Bill, you, you did the ventilation update. You sent something out. Did everybody get a copy of that? What are, are, somebody's getting a crane to come to their school. You bet. So is that going to be like a field trip for all the kids go watch crane operate? And we well, it's actually happening on Wednesday when they're in remote, so they're going to miss it. Oh, 
That's no fun. Bummer. Very upset yeah. as a student. Yeah, me too. Does anybody have any questions or does anybody need us to go over the, the ventilation update? Is there anybody who didn't see it that wants to? Seeing nothing, um, Laura, are you going to be able to talk about the waiting study update? Go ahead. Uh, so tomorrow, we have a bill that's been released for introduction tomorrow. It will be introduced. I don't know. It's H54. Um, I don't know if it's going to go to the Education Committee or the Ways and Means Committee. My guess is it will go to the Education Committee. Um, <clears throat> we are uh, trying to get the, um, there's a simulator for the, um, for the corrected weights or the proposed corrected weights from the study that is up on the Agency of Education website that has the school configurations from 2018 um, that needs to be updated <clears throat> in order to uh, do more simulations with it so we can help legislators understand, you know, if we do this, this is what happens. If we do that, this is what happens. Uh, so working to try and um, get that, uh, get some support to get that updated. Um, uh, in the Senate, I have not seen uh, the Senate bill yet. Uh, there's been a pretty big shift in the Senate uh, education committee. So um, there, uh, uh, Senator Campion is now the chair of that committee. And I don't recall who was the vice chair. It might be Senator Perchelek. Um, oh, no, it's not. It's uh, the senator from Rutland. Um, I can't remember her name. Mark looks like Mark knows who it is. Party? No, Party's Party is also off. Oh, oh, I missed that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's where that is. Uh, you can read the bill. It's up on the um, it's up on the site. Richard, was there more that you wanted me to say? No, I just didn't know if there was any updates you want to give, and I was going to ask Rick Thorpe to just update us on the the Burlington group and his conversations with them. I would one other update I would give is. Uh, it's my understanding that, um, so I have talked to Joint Fiscal Office, which is important, you know, continuing to talk to them. They are, they with, along with the Agency of Education, will have to figure this out. So it's good that they're talking with us. Um, and they have seen some um, pathways for some uh, relief dollars to come in to offset the cost of implementing the weights in the first uh, year. So, <clears throat> So we'll see where we go from here. Okay, thank you, Laura. Any any questions for Laura before we have Rick? Go ahead, Mark. No question, just uh, Senator oh. Hooker. That's who it was. Yeah. yeah. And I was disappointed in you, Laura, because you know what? There's 53 people that got bills in before you, and I figured this was going to be like you were up there sitting on somebody's doorstep. Honestly, I was just trying to get sponsors for probably uh, just confirm with sponsors. It's a weird new uh, process. So, and I missed people too. There's people that are angry because they're not on it. So. Um, Rick, you want to talk about the Burlington group? And kind of update us. Rick is our rep. Rick has um, reached out to a group up north that is, is interested in this waiting study also. So. I guess I would say that they're still really in their infancy. Um, they really have not, they're actually um, in the process of vetting a, uh, a lobbying firm. So that was what most of the uh, particular, most of the particular um, meeting was about, was just meeting with a couple of lobbying firms. So there wasn't really a lot of meat to it. They don't even really know how they're going to fund themselves at this point in time. They would like for people to jump on. They actually have a motion that they would like us to put to the board to join this coalition, but it doesn't seem like they have any particular path forward at this point. It's just looking towards hiring a lobbying firm and then lobbying 
our legislature and governor uh, to pass the waiting study. They don't seem to have any sort of formula as to how they want it passed. They just want it put into legislation, which I believe Laura has already done. So I don't know if we would like to join this or not, um, but at this point in time, I'd like to see a little bit more meat, I guess. There was only 12 people on the call. Uh, so it was, it was not really, it was really just a couple of um, firms really just pitching their, their firm to lobby on behalf of this coalition, which is growing. Richard, may I? Yes. So uh, I just want to encourage us all and myself to uh, shift from calling this the waiting study bill to um, the correcting the weights or the weight correcting bill. So wait, because we already had the waiting study bill and that gave us the waiting study, which now we have the implementation maybe. So I appreciate anybody's help with the language on that. Can we call it the diet bill? Like when you've got too much weight, you have to diet. Um, any questions from the board, comments with Rick and Lord Lors? So I guess, Rick, we'll just wait to see when they have their next meeting and then you'll just keep us informed. I will keep us informed. Uh, that, that would be next step is I want to see if there's anything further that is of Kind of a little more interesting, I guess, to our group. I feel like we could do what they're doing right now, should we choose to, at this point. Okay. Is, is there any comments from, I, I'm sorry, when I said the board, but are there any comments to any of the staff or the, the, the um, parents or anybody who's on the call or on the meeting? I guess it's on the call. Bill, we look good? You look good. No blue hands. Okay, Smurf hands. New business, announced tuition. Uh, I guess over the holiday, Bird Burton sent out their um, tuition. And I think the high school should have too by now, correct, Lori or Bill? Uh, you mean Leland, Leland and Gray? Well, all, isn't it required by, I thought it was the middle of January to have the tuitions announced. Yes, the 15th is the requirement. So I'm just getting to, I think you're the last board for me to check in with about it and then I'll send it all to the state and out to our neighboring districts. Okay, but do we have all the high schools yet or any of the high schools? So Rich, and the, the announced tuition is gonna be for us as a River Valley school district to set our receiving tuition. And then um, not for the collect, not for the paying out at this moment. Oh, okay. Right. But we, it's, hard to, it's hard to do an announced tuition until we have our budget done. Um, correct. Uh, you, you guys are going to say, what are you going to charge someone who comes from a um, town that is a non-operating school? Uh, what are you going to charge them to come to a, a River Valley's elementary school program? A million dollars a student. Go ahead, Lori. So I, I did a little analysis on um, what I would suggest that you increase your tuition to. And uh, this year, this current year, you're at uh, 14.9. And I would suggest going to 15.5, which is a little over a 3% increase. And uh, that is sort of in between where, you know, Wyndham Northeast is and Wyndham Southwest for tuition. Um, so that's my recommendation. Okay, so 15, what was that number again, Lori? 15? $15,500. $15, and what is, what is West River looking to do? So West River is, um, they are 14.4 for 
for elementary and 18 for for secondary. That's this year? I mean this no, that's the that's what they'll be doing for next year for twenty for fiscal year twenty two's budget. So we'll be eleven hundred dollars higher than them. Yes. Okay, Mark, you had your hand up, sir. Yeah. Um. How many tuition students do we have, um, this year? And, um, besides Stratton, um, can somebody list some of the sending towns? Um, because I can't think of any off the top of my head. I can take the second part of your question first. Um, uh, predominantly, it's Searsburg and Stratton are the two non-operating um, school districts that are in our uh, vicinity that uh, send us uh, tuition students. Great, thank you. Mark, did you have two questions or just that one? Yeah, the first part was um, how many tuition students do you have in the year? Lori, do you know that one? For this current year or for next year? For this current year and projected yeah, yeah, for right next in. year. So um, I don't have that number actually memorized. I would need to get that number again from, because there's a difference between what you budget for in the fall and what actually happens. So, you know, I know there's at least two at uh, Wardsboro. I think probably uh, Jen or Tammy could probably answer this question a little bit better that are coming in. And then um, I'm not sure how many in Dover, but not as many as we expected. So there is a reduction in revenue. Currently we have three um, at Wardsboro and one pre-K. Matt? Guys, I'm sorry, I don't have those notes, uh, those numbers off the top of my head. I, I think I see it right up top by the hairline. It says five. It's yeah. a little farther back tonight than it was. Oh, Lori, go ahead. Uh, nope, that was just, that's. No, the other Lori, I'm sorry. Oh, Lori, uh, oh Lori she's Hunter. here. Oh, good, yeah. awesome. She's uh, the opposite of you. Yeah, we, uh, we have three Stratton tuition students and we have uh, pre-K, our other tuition students, we have one from Halifax, one from um, Wilmington, and then uh, we also have a Searsburg student that's pre-K this year. So there could be Tammy and, and Lori O'Hearn. Um, those are should be students that we would have next year too, though, because they're not need, none of them are in, in a upper grade that they're going to move out of, probably. Correct. The pre-K we won't have because um, they're Halifax, Wilmington. They'll go on to their respective school. Searsburg, um, if she continues, I think, yes, that would stay. And yes, Str the Stratton tuition should continue. Tammy? I think I would expect all four to continue next year for Wardsboro. Okay. Bill, did you have any comments? Are you, you all set? So I guess what we need to do then, Lori's recommending a tuition of 15.5, Lori Garland, so that I don't, Lori versus Lori. I don't know how to separate you two out. Um, of 15.5 for students um, attending the River Valley Unified Union School District. So that would have to be a motion so that Lori can present, uh, fill out the paperwork and get that to the, um, to the state. Go ahead, Mark. Um, before I make a motion, um, do we know what Marlboro and Wilmington, well, Twin Valley, um, are going to be doing? Yes, yeah, so Marlboro is, um, did not raise their um, elementary rate, so 14000 and for uh, pre-K and, or no, I'm sorry, K through 8, K through 6, and then 17000 for uh, secondary, which is seventh and eighth for them. And who else was that, Mark? Uh, Twin Valley, Wilmington. So I haven't, I haven't received any of those announced tuitions yet because it's not the deadline. Okay. And, and is your analysis of 15.5 based on the budget that you sent out yesterday? It's actually based, today? yeah, they tell, the, the calculation is based on um, this year's budget. 
uh, current budget. And, um, and that actually comes in pretty high. So it's, there's this dance that has to happen between announcing tuition and then what they call um, allowable tuition. So, which is another calculation that comes later. And if you're over um, your allowable tuition, then you would have we would have to pay back Stratton and pay back Searsburg and that type of thing a certain percentage. So if there's a sweet spot there that you need to fall in the middle. So while, um, for example, uh, um, if we were to charge uh, exactly what it costs, uh, which is upwards of eighteen to $19,000, um, you know, it would be out of whack with the rest of the um, area, number one. And number two, uh, it could come up against that allowable tuition number that happens, um, which is another data collection in the spring. Okay. So I, I try to look at all the aspects. I try to look at what is what can the market hold, right? And got to be stay competitive and also look at, um, you know, what are other districts going up percentage wise and what I think the allowable tuition could come back at. All right. We, um, we, can, we can make an agreement with districts at tuition in that there is no adjustment. <laughs> we used to do that with Wilmington, Twin Valley. And the other thing is, it's not like we, we it's um, something that people are shopping. So um, usually these are schools that don't have an elementary school. So they, they have to go somewhere and the parents don't really look to what the uh, tuition is because they're not paying. It's the school district that's paying it. We've never had somebody not come because our tuition was high. Um, we have had in the past, I know of about five people in all the years at Dover that have actually just tuition their children into our school. They, they, the parents paid the, the, the amount for the child to come to our school because they wanted their child here instead of in the school they were supposed to be. Um, so Lori, I mean, how close have we been in the past to our allowable? How, I mean, is that something we need to look into is, is to say, hey, here's a tuition, but because the, on the other hand of it is if our tuition goes really high then we can ask them to also pay back the difference too if we didn't charge enough. Correct, you can do that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Up to a certain percent, I think it's 3%, yeah. Yeah, but it's both ways. It, it's absolutely both ways. It, unless yeah, it's not you have, a one way. Right, unless you have an agreement. So for instance, in all the years that um, I've worked at Wyndham Central and in this position, uh, Leland and Gray, in which, you know, it was until the was West River never charged back the allowable tuition rate. So, which they could have because their allowable tuition is somewhere in the twenty thousand dollar range, but they only uh, we only announced uh, that eighteen thousand um, dollar because you know I would have to then I would have to increase your budget to allow for that. Um, charge that's that would come through to for the allowable tuition um, but there's been a, a I think an agreement uh, to not do that between schools does that answer any questions sir mark um it did are you uh prepared to entertain a motion I go for it sir so I move that we announce our tuition at 15.5 for fiscal year 22. Do I have a second to that motion? Kate I'll seconds the motion. Oh, sorry. Oh, Dwight Kate. can have it. Oh, no worries, You're Dwight, you can to, have it. Dwight, we're going to give it to you, sir. Um, so we have a motion to uh, mark, uh, to put our tuition at 15.5 for FY22. So that'll be next. September. Um, Mark made the motion, Dwight seconded it. Uh, Mark, you get discussion first if there is any? Uh, no, just thank you for, everyone for the explanations. I appreciate it. Dwight, you have any questions, comments? Or, and anybody? 
Are you all ready to vote? You're all ready to vote all. Uh, Peter, you got the motion, okay? Okay, if you're already vote to wish in at 15-5 for the River Valley Unified Union School, please signify so by saying aye. 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 It appears as though the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, thank you, Lori Garland. That was really good. Go ahead, Mark. Um, just uh, uh, a note. Uh, we're not a union school. I mean, we're a union school, but it's not in our name. Okay. I thought we were the River Valley Unified School District. Right, but no union. Oh, I said it twice. Okay, sorry. Um, approve accounts payable. Lori. Lori, I think hey. you that, right? Or Bill, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Bill sent it out to you with the board documents. I do have a, a correction to make. Um, Kudos to Rich for, for catching $3.30 of tax. Nice job. Um, so the number should be 194800 uh, yeah, $811.71. So we would need a motion for somebody for that amount. And Lori, can you give us that amount one more time, please? Sure. It's 194811.71. And that check is made out to Rich Werner, right? <laughs> the three dollars and thirty cents. No, the one ninety four. <laughs> I'll move that we approve uh, payables of one ninety four eight eleven seventy one. Do I have a second? Quick, Dwight. Wait for Kate. A second. To <laughs> she was waiting for you. She was being polite. So we have a motion by Mark, a second by Dwight. Peter, you, you're all good with the number? Okay. Is there any discussion? Go ahead, Mark. Two quick questions. Um, on page five, um, the fifth one down, um, S and J, um, repaired oil leak and boiler. Um, it's not so much about this, um, specific line item as it is, um, is that a precursor to more problems? Um, and then my other question was, there was one fee for the credit card. Find it. Mark, let's do the, let's do your first question first. Okay. The oil leak in the boiler, that looks like that. Is that Dover School, Matt? Is that something you can tell us about? I think it probably is. If it's S&J Jamrog, that's, that's who we've been using for boiler work. Um, I don't, my, my sense of that, Mark, is that it was not, um, it, it was not something that, that them or the Alliance Mechanical Group was extremely concerned about. I would want to double check that with Chris Medina. Just to just to be sure. Okay. If, just if you don't know, pe people may not know it. There are two oil burn boilers that we have that were put in during the addition, so that's kind of a fortunate thing. So if one was to ever go down, we it's not like we would be without a boiler. And that was um, that was a big point of discussion, believe it or not, back when they were voting on the building. Is you know why did we need two boilers? So. But Matt, if it's something worse, you just you or Lori can let us know. Or... Yeah, I'll, I'll check into it. I don't believe it was anything major. And I will tell you the advantage of having the two boilers just in my time has been awesome. And now with the new system, not only are they redundant, but they're automated. And um, we get alert notifications when something goes wrong with it. It's pretty pretty amazing considering the boilers are what, 30 years old, Rich? Yeah, nine. yes. Yeah. So. so anyway. 25. 25 years old, yeah, 1996, right? Yeah. Mark, you, your second question, did that take care of your first one, sir? It, it did, um, thank you. Um, on page one, the one, two, three, four, I don't know, but the sixth section down, um, the, the line for fees on the commercial card. 
Um, I thought we had kind of resolved that by paying ahead of time, well, making sure we got things paid on time. We did. Um, the, I'll, I'll take the complete blame for this. Um, that I didn't realize that uh, Donna, who processes your pay, uh, your AP, didn't have access to the credit card statements. Ooh. And so it basically, the mail delayed and she got the statement late. And, but now she has full access and can pull them herself. So it shouldn't be a problem. Great, thank you for the explanation. Sure, no problem. Mark, you all set? Dwight, you have any questions or comments, sir? Yeah, I, just, I, I just have one question. There's a charge to the Mount Snow child care. I'm just wondering for pre-K tuition. Um, just curious how that, what that is. Pre-K, you know, that's part of that law. So if you, for pre-K, you can send your child anywhere and the district right. is responsible for it, even if you have a pre-K uh, uh, in your area where like elementary school that doesn't count and, and um, yeah. it doesn't count. It was just part of the preschool um, so that people who went like for a full day program, so that way they don't have to like bring their child somewhere for the morning class and then take them somewhere else. So they are allowed oh, to serve their um, approved and accredited. I see. So if another a student came from another district, then we would get the money from their district for their students coming in ours. I got it. Okay. Yeah. And, so and again, yeah. that's kind of what Lori was, O'Hearn was saying earlier. You know, we have some students from other towns that have, you know, elementary schools but they're choosing to have their child come to our preschool, but then they can't, they won't be able to do that for, um, you know, once again into elementary school. Yeah, I thought the state paid. I didn't realize it was the district paying. How that works. Well, no, the state is, the state claims they pay it because the state, remember all our money comes from the state. <laughs> okay, so okay. The state claims that they're really paying it all. Nice. <laughs> okay, thank you. You all set, Dwight? Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other questions or comments from anybody? Members, staff, public, parents? You do not have any blue hands. You are good to go. Okay. Jennifer's moving around a lot over there. She keeps attracting my attention. <laughs> if you're all ready to vote, all in favor, signify so please by saying aye. 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 Okay, it appears as though the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, principal's report, like we got a <laughs> stuttering now. We got a written principal's report. Um, are there any, if there's no questions on the written principal report, Matt updated us on going on in Dover. Um, Tammy or Matt, do you have any other comments, thoughts, questions? Go ahead, Matt, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to note that um, I didn't get the Dover numbers in there under safe and healthy schools. And we had about 50 students um, in person the week of January 4th, um, which left about 60 students remote um, during that week. And like we talked about, much of that was, was pre-K, but those are the numbers for Dover. Thank you, Matt. Tammy, you have any, oh, Matt, do you have anything else to add? No, Tammy, you have anything to add? No. Anybody have any questions or anything that wasn't in the reports? Go ahead, Mark. Um, I'm just curious um, how you're handling um, the winter benchmarks for students that are remote. Are you bringing them in? I think we do. I think we do the same thing. Um, we have them come in and we close off the art room in, in Dover and they enter their health screened there, sanitizer, everything's sort of quarantine. Um, they do their mid-year benchmarks and then they leave out the same door. Um, they're set up, you know, with social distancing, with carol barriers, uh, these um, cardboard-like barriers that, you know, go between the seats to make sure that we do everything we can to keep distance and they're masked. We use hand sanitizer. Um, there's no um, reused materials. All the materials are single use. Um, and again, it's a schedule. We communicate directly with the remote families and we make a personal schedule that works for them. Usually after school when there's no other kids in. Really. Makes sense. Thank you. 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 Th
makes sense. Uh, just a quick follow up to that. Um, do you have you gotten pushback from parents? Um, and I ask that in the sense, um, might we have any trouble reaching the um, ninety five percent uh, requirement of the feds? So that 95% relates to uh, the mandated assessments that will come from the state of Vermont. What Matt is talking about is benchmark assessments, which inform our instruction and allow our teachers to have data in which to then design instruction that is individual to each student, as well as to the cohort grades. So that uh, the 95% will uh, factor in if we take the SBAC, which is scheduled for May, um, we are preparing for that, but uh, an announcement has not been made from the AOE whether that is going to occur or not. Thank you. I did not realize those were separate tests. Dover started doing that several years ago because, you know, basically when you gave the test once a year, you only knew once a year when something, you know, when there's an issue. And by testing more frequently, um, it gave the staff a real good um indication if what they were doing was working or where maybe they need to spend some more time and where they, they were doing good and they didn't need to spend any more time. I think, Bill, that was just prior to you coming on board and I think Matt's continued and now it's become a standard in the district, right, Bill? Uh, yes, and I would say that it's also been occurring at Wardsboro for over a decade as well. So um, I think it's a common practice um, within the River Valley District. Mark, are you all set? Dwight, you have something? Yeah, a couple questions. Um, I always just like hearing about field trips that you know the schools would do. Obviously, we're not doing any field trips nowadays. Um, just kind of curious, you know, what kind of things have been done in the past, or anything in the future coming up that they have any kind of virtual trips around the world or anything like that going on. And um, then I had another question after that too. Yeah, so we don't, um, we don't have anything planned in the near future. We did have some opportunities earlier this fall where um, we were able to have um, the museum from Marlboro come in and we did something on the hill for all of us. Um, but we're certainly always looking for ways um, to be able to outreach with um, any of the you know, community organizations that would be willing to do that. So nothing really solid yet, Dwight. It's been a strange year for sure. <laughs> Oh, sure, I know. Dwight, in, um, in Dover, we had a, we've always had a, a strong tradition of going to the Hildeen Science Program up in Manchester with our kids. And um, so it was a big, it was a big uh, disappointment to not be able to do that this year. But Hildeen completely pulled through, contacted us in the fall, and they arranged to send their people down here. So we had some on-site field trips where um, they sent down uh, Dion Newton, who is a, a local woman who I think she lives in Wyndham, um, but she works, she's the education director for the, the program. And she came down for two days this fall and did these super cool nature programs with the kids outside um, distance. It was, it was really fun and she had a good time. Kids really appreciated it too. like to try to do more of that, but, but, but winter has gotten in our way a little. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, speaking of winter, I just had a question about winter sports. I was wondering if the kids are gonna be able to do the ski program this, this winter or what's what happened with that or is that has that been shelved or what, what the latest is? I think Ladies Tammy's first. frozen. Oh, she does look frozen. <laughs> She's frozen. Yeah. Um, I would love to, Lori O'Hearn has been really supporting the winter program we are doing something here in Dover in uh, conjunction with Mount Snow at this point. That's the plan to start later in January. But Lori, since you're here, maybe you want to say a word or two about that? Sure. Uh, actually, Steve Cruz just stopped today and picked up the paperwork for the program. This year, it's um, drastically reduced the number of people participating. We have 13 skiers and seven snowboarders, so it's 20 total. We usually have in the 60 person range. So I think COVID is contributing to this um, greatly. 
but the program is gonna be Wednesday afternoons um, on our remote days. And the parents are responsible for driving the students to the mountain. And um, they will do their program from 1230 to 230, either ski or board. And then they can either do free ski or they can go home with their parents. And could I just add too that the ages of the program did change this year too. That was a thing that impacted um, my family. But on a related note to Dwight's question earlier, I just wanted to share that the first and second grade in Wardsboro has been doing a ton of outside learning. And when I pick up my child every day, the amount of excitement about those experiences is just awesome and phenomenal. And their new seating arrangements last week was just a huge thing that the kids were super excited about um, because they're outside. The, you know, the surfaces are getting cold and wet. So the teacher um, procured hammocks and the kids have been learning in hammocks outside. Sounds like fun. Hey, um, I think Tammy, are you back? Did you, you froze up for a little bit, but did you get Dwight's question, how it relates to Wardsboro? I'm having um, an unstable connection, so I can't kind of keep going in and out. I must have missed it. So Dwight was asking about winter sports, you know, at Mount Snow. Okay. Yeah, we um, we have about, is it 16 kids, Jen, signed up for winter sports starting next Wednesday? Now, but yes, it's 15 now. <laughs> great, thank you. You all set, Dwight? Yeah, that's great, thank you. Okay, and anybody else, Kate, did you wanna follow up on that at all? Anything you said? Um, anecdotally, I did hear that a number of the, the students who are not, uh, you know, in the age grouping that Mount Snow is offering this year, a lot of the parents are planning on participating on their own on Wednesday afternoons and taking their child to the mountain. So I've heard that um, from a lot of the Wardsboro parents in kindergarten, first, and even second grade. Okay, thank you, Kate. Go ahead, Mark. We're still on principal's report, everybody. Um, I actually just want to ask Kate, what was the change in, in ages that their um, snow's taking? Um, it's now ages seven and up. So that's um, the kindergartens and the first graders are typically under that age group. So it, it was a bummer because my, my student, she had been doing it since she was in pre-K. So that was a bummer, but we haven't really talked about it yet. So I'll be taking a lot of Wednesday afternoons off so I can go and take her to Mount Snow myself. I mean, whether this was a COVID decision they made or a veil decision? Um, I think it's a chairlift decision, to be honest, because of the, the chaperones, the number, like they, from experience of being a chaperone, they would typically want a, a pretty high chaperone ratio for the younger kids, because you need to have a, a higher ratio of um, adults to younger kids for riding the chairlift. Um, and that's just my take on it. I don't have official information, but I'm sure Tammy knows the official. So for the, the age group that they would have qualified for, they are doing a one to two ratio this year at Mount Snow. So they, they just couldn't justify doing the program based on that ratio. Thank you. So anything else for the principal's report, folks? Seeing nothing, Bill, we all good? Okay, um, superintendent's report leads right into you, Bill. Um, so I've provided you with a written um, superintendent's report. Um, just some general things. Uh, as Laura mentioned, the uh, legislature is uh, open for business and um, the normal um, legislative reports will be coming out less frequently, but we'll be getting more frequent from the VSBA um, blogs. So that's just something to be aware of in your uh, inbox is that you're not gonna get the uh, legislative report uh, you know, every three weeks detailing out four or five pages, but you're probably gonna get way more frequently blogs. So I would just uh, pay attention to your email um, that, um, 
that is something that uh, you want to be looking for. Um, additionally, the uh, new uh, funding for uh, the pandemic was passed in late December. And the AOE is now um, diving through, I believe it is something like 5,600 pages of how that is going to come to the state and how that is going to be distributed to school districts. Um, in our conference, our weekly conference call with superintendents and the secretary of ed um, on Thursday, uh, he indicated that during the month of January, uh, he and his task force will be planning uh, the recovery work uh, that will be required by the AOE, and we'll be getting guidance on that in early February. And the expectation is, is that recovery work guidance uh, will be funded by some of this money. So it could be things like uh, after school tutoring, it could be professional development for teachers, it could be summer programs. Uh, we are not quite sure yet. Um, we will find that out in the beginning of February, but all of that is in works at the state level right now. Okay, so are there any questions for Bill, their superintendent's report? Okay, seeing none. Um, meeting on January 18th um, is Martin Luther King holiday. We, um, you know, we always meet the first and third. We moved this one off because of not wanting to burden the, the administration with having to go to a meeting the first day back after the break. Um, we have met on Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the past, and we have not met on that day in the past too. So the other option for us is to move our meeting to the 25th. Um, so what do you all want to do? Go ahead, Mark. Um, I think that we should move it to the 25th if people are available. Okay, any other thoughts or comments? Laura Sevilla's got a thumb up. I see that, but it's not blue, it's yellow. Yeah, I think that... Dwight, go ahead. No, I think 25th would work for me. I think that makes sense to, to do it at that time. Okay, it's good with that. The only one that I haven't heard from is Rick. I'm fine with that too, thank you. Okay, so then I gotta go to Lori Garland and Bill and Matt and Tammy. Are you guys good with that date? Okay, Matt's good. Tammy's good. Bill, you don't do our second meetings. Lori Garland, are you okay with that? That's fine. Okay, so then why don't we, um, at the end of the meeting, we'll just announce the next meeting, but we'll, we'll plan on meeting the 25th at six o'clock. Okay, guys? Sounds good. Okay. Um, I had one other quick, two other quick things under new business. Andy McLean's here. He's down in level three, seat four. And um, we had to talk about elections because we're not sure that the, I think Andy, you had a, a concern or something about Wardsboro um, because of the, the election from the floor and then they're probably not gonna have a meeting in Wardsboro and how do we do that? So did you wanna wait, talk to us about that or get, let us know where you think to go? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, that's right. We're not sure we're going to have a floor meeting uh, in Wardsboro for a town meeting. Um, they may decide to do the meeting by Australian ballot. And it's unclear because we don't have the legislation whether we could still have some sort of a floor meeting or um, even though most or all of the articles would be Australian ballot. But it's possible that we won't have a floor meeting in uh, in Dover or Wardsboro this year. Um, I did, the last time I was here, Rich, he asked me to grab the, the uh, opinions from the uh, attorney when we were first talking about this a couple of years ago. And uh, the opinion of the attorney is that the board can vote to change how you elect your officers. It doesn't have to go before the people at the annual meeting. I would suggest that you vote to um, do us do an Australian ballot for Wardsboro's um, director this year. 
Um, nothing says it has to continue after this year, but um, you know, towns are gonna be looking to sign warnings fairly soon by the end of the month. Um, your next meeting is the 25th. Um, you know, that's a little late. Those, uh, those warnings will be, uh, will be hammered out over the next week or two. Um, and uh, just with the legislature perhaps allowing us to postpone town meetings with the uncertainty around whether there will be the ability to have a floor vote, I would suggest that you guys do an Australian ballot in Wardsboro for the um, director. Now, um, that would be an Australian ballot um, that would be run at your meeting on the 13th of April. Um, if you have a meeting, if you don't, we would just have an election or a ballot. Um, we'd have two, one for Dover, one for Wardsboro. One will be printed on blue paper, one on yellow paper. I can handle that, um, but I think you should vote as a board to change the election of the, uh, of the Wardsboro officer uh, to an Australian ballot. I can talk about some other things having to do with the meeting and elections and uh, possibilities if you would like. Um, but that's something you might want to consider doing at this meeting if your next meeting is the 25th. If your next meeting was the 19th, I would say maybe you could hold off, but you might want to consider that. So Andy, the, the meeting this year is supposed to be held in Wardsboro. Mm -hmm. If we do, how would you, so if there's an election just for, because you'll do the Dover school board member just at the whatever the Dover select board decide to do for the town meeting is that correct so <clears throat> the way things sit currently if you do nothing we will uh have an Australian ballot for the Dover director um in conjunction with town meeting or the town vote or whatever it happens to be in Dover okay and I can handle that, that's no problem. Um, I'll do it with everything else I do for Dover. Um, when you decide, if you decide rather, to um, change your Wardsboro director to an Australian ballot, um, you could also decide to move um, the Australian ballot for your Dover director to your meeting on the 13th of April or if you postpone it some other date, but tie that to your annual meeting instead of Dover's town meeting. Um, and that I brought that up last time. We've thought about it uh, over the past couple of years. Um, what's the best way to do this? Um, you know, I'm starting to think that perhaps we just need to um, uh, pull up our our big boy pants, big girl pants, and um, and run our own show and have an election at our meeting. Um, and if you decide to go with an Australian ballot in, in Wardsboro, then make both of those directors by Australian ballot at your meeting. Um, you know, the whole, you guys trying to sign the town meetings, this year, it's just almost unworkable. Um, and try and figure out if there will be a floor vote. But moving on in the future, where the meetings now are so um, uh, far apart in time, um, you know, it might just be um, better for people, for your attendance at your meeting. Um, we know that uh, attendance at annual meetings um, depends upon the people having something to decide, you know, having some. When something on the on the agenda sparks their interest, they show up. Um, elections can be those things. Um, the they feel they're actually making a difference and doing something, and that genders more participation. It's something to think about. Um, you don't have to do that this year, but if it works out in Wardsboro this year and you like it, um, it, might be something to think about. And you could do it right now, or at your next meeting. Um, in Dover as well as Wardsboro. 
I would Andy, risk would, would, doing something. Would that be, if, if you're going to vote by the officers by ballot, but we're going to do a meeting, an in-person meeting to do the vote on the, um, to vote on the budget and other articles, mm -hmm. do you have to be open from like eight in the morning or seven in the morning till seven at night? Or how does that? I work? would have to be open uh, from 10 to seven. Um, we could open as early as I think five, um, but definitely from 10 to seven, yes. And two locations or one location? Would it just be like every other year you would vote? So we, we could decide that. We could decide that. We could have two locations or we could just swap back and forth and, and um, hold the election uh, in one location where we have our meeting. I would probably think that that would be good. That way you get more people from Dover to show up to your meeting in Wardsboro, more people from Wardsboro to show up to your meeting in Dover. Um, but we could we could talk about that and decide that. Because for you to like have to be there for two polling places and that kind of stretches you a little thin. Um, it would, and that would be part of our discussion. You know, the easiest thing for me is if you both would vote your directors from the floor at your annual meeting, then I don't have to do anything, <laughs> you know, but, um, and, and that has been a concern for me is making the job that I currently occupy as streamlined and easy as I can so that you don't need any kind of expertise to make this happen. Um, but over the past few years, it seemed like this might be the best way to go for the people, for the uh, union district, um, much as you know, I might not want to run an election. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, you know, it's not gonna be a huge turnout. Hopefully it's gonna be a good turnout, but it's not gonna be unmanageable. Um, and it does, it does help to create the sense that you are now a district with responsibilities and, um, and the folks who can vote um, feel that, hey, I need to show up. You know, there's a contested race and so-and-so is running and they feel this way about this issue. Um, it helps us to be more of a community. I like the fact that um, in order to be a candidate on a ballot, you need to, in a normal year, collect signatures. Um, you are stating, hey, I wanna do this. I'm invested in this. You know, it's not something where, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna, um, I'm not a part of Wardsboro's town meeting, but, um, and God bless them. Um, you know, it's not something where you're drafting people who may not want to even, you know, I just showed up to the meeting and now everybody's saying I got to I got to be this person on the spot and maybe I don't want to or, you know, it's it's um, I think it uh, it gives you a more invested um, candidacy to be getting signatures. So. To break this down, Andy, I think so that we don't spend all night on it and, and don't mm -hmm. have a lot of time. Um, the Wardsboro position seems to be the, the harder one because to put it on the Dover ballot and, and vote ahead of time isn't a huge thing. So, but that would be to do a ballot for Wardsboro. That's a pretty big change. So I would like to ask the Wardsboro, the three Wardsboro board members, you know, what you guys think of what Andy brought up. If we were to change that. Don't all speak at once, Dwight. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think based, based from last year, you know, it just didn't, it was very clunky, as we know, um, kind of switching the meeting in the middle of a meeting to, to vote on an officer from at the town meeting. I was there, it didn't really go smoothly. So I, I'm already in favor of making a change to what we currently have. Um, I think, you know, normally I'd like to kind of honor the tradition of voting from the floor. And, and my opinion would be to, to vote from the floor at our annual meeting for the Wardsboro rep, but these aren't normal years, normal times. So 
I hear what Andy's saying, and, and it seems to me it makes the most sense to, to vote Australian ballot at our annual meeting. And also, Andy, too, remember this year you have two people from Wardsboro because we have an appointed person will have to run for the remainder of that term and then the person whose term is up too. Um, so that's gonna, it'll be a little bit even harder like to try to maybe vote from the floor. Um, so, you know, the ballot maybe makes sense. I don't, I don't know. Go ahead, Andy. Who's the appointed person again? Kate. I'm sorry? Kate Rideout was appointed by the board because there's nobody that's, that, you know, a town meeting stood up and said they would accept the, the position. And I think, right. Dwight, you run this year, right? Right. I don't know for re-election. Who did Kate replace? Uh, she took uh, Barry's spot from the original three. Well, his, his term expired, so I don't know if that makes a difference. Right. Oh, I see. There. No, his term expired, but Kate got appointed to it after the election. So Kate would have to, usually it's a, you're appointed to the next regular special election. We haven't had a special election. So Kate has to run for the remainder of that term, correct? Right, she, but the, the, the position was vacant. Right, but that's what happens when, you know, I mean, if, if I keeled over right now, it would be a vacant <laughs> position. So you guys that's could true. appoint only to the next election or special election. Right. So, so Wardsboro has two people. Kate and Rick, what are your thoughts? So back with another I, question. Uh, I, I don't. I'm just wondering how much time there is to get two people to get. You still need to gather names, right, in order to get on the ballot. Not, not this year. No. No, you just have to fill. Everybody just going to be a write-in. Intend. No, you intend to run. You, you complete a form. So okay. It, that was something the legislature did so you didn't have to go out and contract with 60 people coronavirus. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. So that, that makes perfect sense. Um, I, I think that having consistency across the two towns, um, I've always kind of been in favor for. So I, I think that doing that, at least for this year, uh, I think we should do and see how, it, see how it works out, not doing it from the floor. We haven't had a lot of luck from the floor in the past in getting somebody in Wardsboro, so... Um, I, I think I all for trying this this year and seeing how it works. I think you Kate? got very lucky last year. <laughs> Kate. So I've actually, I've never gone to the town meeting. It's a day I would have to take off of work. So I've never gone. So I'm in definite favor of the, the, the ballot situation. And I would assume that there's other people like me in Wardsboro who will, do not take the day off and do not go to town meeting, unfortunately. But, um, so yeah, I think the ballot makes sense. So Andy, how do you want us, what, what do you want the motion to be to make sure that we cover it? Do you have that? Um, I guess the motion would be, I have, uh, let's see, the articles of agreement here somewhere, but you well, could it, it, I imagine- Andy, it, 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 Hey, well, just real quick, if we're going to do it on our, our regular meeting date in April, then we're okay to the next meeting, right? And then you can give us in writing what you want. So, so if you, if you are confident today that you will vote as a board to change this, then we don't need to worry about warning any of this on the town meeting warnings, which are being prepared now. Um, and, and you don't need to vote, I can come up with some specific language for you tied to the articles of agreement for your next meeting. Um, if you are undecided, if you're like, well, maybe next time, you know, we'll rethink it and we'll, we'll want to, you know, try and do something with town meeting, you're going to have to get in touch with the select boards, make sure that they do want to have a floor vote in Wardsboro, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're confident that this is the way you want to go, then yeah, you can put it off because your meeting isn't until April 13th. So we have plenty of time to get consent forms together and ballots and all of that business. Okay, so I guess then I, I want to ask Mark and, and Laura on the Dover side, um, do we want to move so we're all consistent or do we want to you know, just get do the our election 
for the Dover rep at town meeting, right, Andy? Because we can still just be on the ballot there. We don't have to do anything special for that. That's correct. You could change both or you could only change one. Yep. Okay. Go ahead, Mark, and then Laura. Um, so I've got a question for probably Andy. Um, but first, my personal preference would be, um, and personally, I think it should be district wide that we are voting um, that we, if, if we do an Australian ballot, that it goes out with um, the town's election on town meeting day as general rule. Um, I think that's when you can get the best turnout. Um, for this year, I definitely think that um, we should stick to what um, we're used to in Dover um, and that being on whatever town meeting day ends up being. Um, but question is, logistically, if Wardsboro is going to a Australian town meeting, Australian ballot town meeting, um, can we piggyback that for the Wardsboro um, election? So, um, this year, um, given the difficulties and the indecision, the, the uncertainty around how town meeting is going to play out in both Dover and Wardsboro, I would suggest distancing yourselves from town meeting for this year. Um, especially in Wardsboro where they're not used to this sort of a thing. Um, and I understand your point about um, participation and getting the most people to participate that you can. Um, and that would happen at town meeting. Um, and the other side of that coin is that um, by tying yourself to town meeting, you're diminishing your meeting. Um, and, uh, and making the process much more complicated. And, um, and time consuming. Um, but that's up to you. I, I would, it kind of relates to another thing you're gonna to have to decide, which is whether you mail ballots to every voter in your district. Now, you probably don't wanna get into that. That's, that's a long discussion. Um, I'll tell you briefly, you know, cost-wise, you know, you'd have to probably print uh, ballot envelopes. We, as towns, wouldn't have enough for you to supply you folks. Three ballot envelopes per voter plus the, the uh, ballots, plus uh, the machine configuration. You're looking at four or $5,000 to do that. And of course, you're gonna get better participation if you mail ballots to everybody. Um, but um, while I believe Australian ballot is the best way for us to handle directors, as far as articles go, they're a completely different animal. You can't, you can't modify, um, you know, an election and say, hey, we'll take, you know, Joe and, and, and Deirdre are running for this position. We'll take, you know, Deirdre's smarts and Joe's, you know, good looks and we'll, we'll, we'll modify the motion and we'll come up with, a, you know, you, when you are, when you are um, voting an article, um, from the floor is by far the best way to do that, by far. And when you choose to have uh, articles voted from the floor, you're choosing less participation. And when you choose not to mail ballots to everybody, you're choosing less participation. But I would argue that, um, you know, participation isn't always everything. And I think, I think that we owe it to ourselves as a district to build, and, and it's gonna take time, to build an identity of our own, a meeting of our own, elections of our own, get people used to, 
hey, it's time for a school meeting and time for a school vote. Um, just my opinion. But I, I, I understand where you're coming from, for sure. Um, Laura, Laura can probably say more about this than, than I can, but it, the, the bill that has been introduced in legislature um, would cover costs for mailing um, ballots this year. Um, so the cost probably wouldn't be an issue um, if we wanted to mail, mail out. Um, I'd say for this year, for, for this COVID year, um, even in April, um, no matter, even if it's months after that, I would still be voting for a 100% Australian um, meeting. Um, I don't think that we should be looking at doing an in-person. Um, so in Mark, hang, hang on a second though. We're not discussing the annual meeting yet. Okay, that's our next meeting. So let's keep it to the election, okay? I was just responding to what Andy was yeah. saying. Okay, but, well, um, so Andy was on a roll. Yeah, oh, sorry. Andy, no, Andy was on a roll. That, that's um, fine, because we're going to have to discuss it eventually. But again, that's going to be another long conversation. And, and we're running a little late. And I've got a couple people here that need to leave beaning. So I just didn't, I don't want to get off the tangent too much. Um, so let, let, if it's okay, Mark, can I just have Laura weigh in yeah, on this? Of We'll go, we'll move forward. Go ahead, Laura. So I'm just going to read you, um, about the funding. If I can ever get my, no, Laura, Laura, well. Laura, Laura, that, that, yeah. that's not, let's talk. We want to talk about how we want to vote for the directors, not about if we're going to send ballots out to everybody. So I, I would like to see us be consistent and um, I hear um, Andy's um, uh, uh, thinking about moving off of town meeting day. And um, I think I would support that. Okay, so then you guys wanna create uh, your, we wanna have a whole separate election by Australian ballot on April 13th for the two school directors positions. Is that what I'm hearing? In both towns, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Andy, hang uh, on. I wanna go with, uh, so Richard. Yeah. I'm gonna go with our town clerk on this, so. I would like both towns to do it at the same time. And when we do it, I wanna go with Andy. I mean, this is really hard as we all know, the modifications here. So I wanna take that into consideration. Yeah. Okay. So what I think that I'm hearing is that, that you guys want to go ahead and, know, and on April when our annual meeting is that that day there will be a ballot vote for the school board members for both Dover and Wardsboro, is that correct? Not seeing anybody move their heads. Rick, you're That's saying correct. Mark is saying no. Dwight, Laura's saying yes. yes. Okay, so I tell you guys what. Why don't we? Why don't we do this? Because it doesn't matter whether we have a meeting or not. Okay, and if we have to do vote our budget by ballot, then we'll. we'll that was something we can deal with. We don't have to do it right this minute. So why doesn't somebody make a motion then? Um, and that we can modify this, I think, Andy, next meeting, because it's off to the, the fifth, um, you know, it's off into April, but that we, it's the intent of the school board, of this school board to have any officer position elected any school board member positions elected by ballot at the school district annual meeting. Is it Australian ballot or just ballot? No, Australian ballot. That's so moved. Ballot. Laura, go ahead. So I said so moved. Okay. Do I have a second to Laura's motion? I'll second it. Okay, so Laura moved and Dwight seconded that um, in April at the River Valley's annual meeting, there'd be a ballot, an Australian ballot election for all school directors that are up for election. Peter, you got that? 
Do you want to specify that date? That's not what you said originally. No, it's it's in April. I don't think I have to specify the date because what no, the intent, the intent of the board is to right. Got the intent it. of the board is at the annual meeting in April. And then Andy, that gives you to our next meeting to give us the exact wording. But once we vote this, we can't really go back because we won't have enough time if you want to have the voter, the Dover people vote because that has to be filed ahead of time. Does everybody understand right. that? So, and one thing I, I might say is in your motion, um, just have the Australian ballot occur at your annual meeting. That way- that's, that's what the motion is. On your meeting, it won't well, be that's, answered. Right, that's what the motion is. Okay. That's why we didn't specify a date. We just specified okay. an meeting in okay. April. I mean, we-, we Well, could, you could have it in May. Okay, so our annual meeting. Laura, are you okay with that? Dwight, you good with that? Yeah. Okay. So can you please read the motion back? Mr. Billy, I move that the intent of the board is to have any officer position elected by Australian ballot at the school district annual meeting. A board Director. position, board member, director member, not because we don't want to vote the auditors and the school directors. Okay. Right. Everybody else, I think we're still okay just voting at the meeting like we usually do. And if we have to go to Australian ballot, then we'll, you know, for the whole meeting, then we'll, we'll have that discussion at that time. Is that okay with everybody? So we have a motion. We have, hang on, Mark. We have a motion. We have a second. Does everybody understand the motion? Yes. Okay. So Laura, you made the motion. You get first dibs at talking. No, you're all set. Dwight, you want to say anything? Yeah, I just have one question. Um, can does the, can the whole board determine the directors for Wardsboro or Dover, or do the Dover board the Dover directors need to determine their own election? In other words, how does that? I just want to yeah, clarify you, that. you have to vote like Andy was saying earlier. There would have to be a couple different ballots, one color if you're a Dover resident, because no, no, no. Pardon? No, no. What I'm, what I'm saying is, can do the do the entire board selects how the, the Wardsboro directors are elected? Yes. In other words. So the yes. whole board can determine that. Right, that's the that's yeah. the board's decision. Remember before when we were discussing this, because originally we voted by ballot and then we wanted to have the conversation because Wardsboro traditionally had not voted by ballot and then you wanted to vote from the floor and, and we discussed it at the first couple meetings. And that's what a majority of the voters from Wardsboro wanted to keep continue to vote from the floor and a majority of people over want to continue to vote by ballot. So we went that way and we had two separate ways to vote. Okay. So the, the board, the, the entire board can determine how elections are taking place in right. each town. That was, that was the information that Andy got, but we decided not to do that as a board last time. We decided right. to bring it up to the voters as an article at the annual meeting. That's right. That okay, like thanks. Three years ago. I think that was the first year we were operating. We met in Lordsboro. It was a good memory. Okay, so I, uh, Laura, you moved again. So Laura, Dwight, go ahead, Peter. Just to be clear, uh, the wording should probably be moved that the intent of the board is to elect school directors by Australian ballot at the school director annual, school district annual meeting. Right, that's, what, that clear? Uh, we, that's what we said. Well, it wasn't, but that's the word smithing. Okay, so, is, so again, is everybody good with that? Okay. I got Laura and Dwight. Mark, go ahead. So I've got one comment and then one question for Laura and Dwight. Um, for Laura and Dwight, um, would you accept a friendly amendment that um, adds for 2021 so that this limits it to just this upcoming all this year? Well, you can, broke up a little. Mark, you can move that amendment and then we can have a second if there's a, the interest in seconding it. And one of those guys can second it. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. I didn't quite hear you, Mark. Oh, I I, I wanted to know whether um, you guys would be willing to add um, at the end of your the motion for 2021, so that it would just be specific for this this year. So I, I will I will move that. I don't. I don't uh, as, I, as so hang on, Dwight. Hold, hold Mark's, on, on. Hang on, everybody. Mark is making an amendment to the motion that it be just for the 2021 year. Uh, the FY22 election or the, the 2021 election. 
So is there a second to Mark's amendment? You're seconding it, Laura? Yes. So Mark, now we have a, an amendment, Peter, which is just to clarify that this is just for the one year, for just for this coming meeting. Well, to amend the motion to specify the year of 2021. Right, only. So Mark, you get first dibs at talking about why you think that's a good amendment or to sell it or? I, I think that, that doing this for an, an open-ended motion is, is, is um, it's not specific to a year. Yeah, I think that would actually be making the change um, for, the long, for the long haul, which I think is a longer conversation for us. Okay, and the only reason we're making this motion now is, is so that it's the intent of the board, because if, remember, if we don't vote on this now, then Andy won't be, you know, and because we're not meeting next week, we have no time to be able to get that motion approved if we want to have the election. If the election stays the same, then there's not enough time to get the Dover person on the Dover ballot because that's going to be done ahead of time. That's why we're, we're doing this. Um, and again, the board can vote at any time to change it. And too, but Laura, you, you second into motion, you get second dibs and comments. All set? Okay, is there any comments on the amendment? So the amendment's clarifying that it's just gonna be for this year. So we have to vote the amendment first. Hearing nothing, you guys yeah, all- I'll, 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 I have a comment. I just, I'm just not sure how, how you just said it yourself, Rich, I'm not sure how necessary it is. The board has the ability to change change this every year if we wanted to. Um, and um, we certainly could do that again next year based on how this year goes. And that's kind of what Andy was talking about was let's, you know, this, let's get our own meeting, let's see how it goes and then take it from there. So, you know, I think we should, my opinion is, is to, to leave it as is. And, and then if we don't like it, we can change it, change it back again at another meeting. Okay, any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Okay. If, unless some, uh, any opposed, please signify so by saying nay. Nay. Okay, so let's do, we got to do a roll call vote. So I'm going to start with the motion maker. Mark, you an aye or nay? Aye. Laura, are you seconding? Are you an aye or an nay? Aye. Kate, you're just above Laura on my screen. Aye. Dwight, you're next to Kate. <laughs> nay. And Rick, you're below Dwight. This is like Hollywood Squares. I'm going to be an A also. Okay, so I count three to two. Does anybody disagree? And the chair goes with the majority, so it's a four to two vote. So the amended motion is, Peter, please read that. Uh, to uh, the intent of the board is to elect school directors by Australian ballot at the 2021 school district annual meeting only. Sounds good. Does everybody agree with that? Okay, are you ready to vote? Yes, Mark. So um, just a question to throw out there. If we do have a in-person meeting, um, I would want to see, um, I want to see a polling place in each, in each town. Um, so that-, okay, that that's, that's more of an operational thing for Andy. So let, let's get through this vote because if it voted down, it's a mute point. And I, I think it's not germane to the question. I mean, the question is, is this how you want to vote? So is there any other comments? Are you all ready to vote? Okay, if you're all ready to vote, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Hey, are there any opposed? So it appears as though the eyes have it. The eyes have it. So Andy, if you could do us a favor, you, you'll have the minutes in a couple days. 
if you need us, so for the 25th, if we messed up something or did something wrong, but it is the intent of the board to go ahead and do your recommendation, have it be by ballot at our annual meeting. So maybe you can let us know at the next meeting what that's going to look like for us. And, and you heard some concerns from you know uh, some of the board members about polling places and whatnot, and I guess maybe times and stuff. So um, can we maybe, do you think the 25th is enough time for you or, or Will we have enough time if we wait till that first meeting in February? Um, yeah, I can, I can, uh, I can put some some stuff together for you, some ideas about how things will look. Um, you're also going to want to consider other things um, about the voting process and your meeting. Um, but I'm sensing you don't want to get into these things. Do you want people to start thinking about? You know, one thing you're going to have to think about is whether or not to mail ballots to everybody. Um, and I think, Andy, that'd be a, that's going to be a long discussion, possibly. Okay. Let's let's see what the law says. The legislature still haven't okay. confirmed anything. So I, I think instead of talking in possibilities, let's wait till we see what they say. I just want to make sure that on this voting thing that we're OK and that you have everything you need in, in our motion with the intent. You know, do we will we need to just confirm that with like a, a regular motion at the next meeting? Yeah, that should all work. A lot of what you're asking me to provide you will depend on some other decisions you're going to make, but I'll I'll have what I can for you at the next meeting. I think uh, we're at a good spot and uh, we can move forward from here. Okay, I really appreciate Andy that you are uh, taking some time out on your Monday night because I know you get to go to an exciting meeting on Tuesday nights. So. Um, oh, this is fun. Okay. Well, we really appreciate it, Andy. All right. So, Thank you. We're, but you can stick around. You don't have to leave. Okay. Let's move Lori Garland, financials, budget, second look. So Lori prepared a very nice, um, and I, I don't know if it's all Lori or if she had some help, but um, we all should have gotten a um, kind of a booklet that looked something like I can't find it, but it looks warning for the 2021 River Valley board meeting. And Lori had some charts and graphs in it. Um, and there was a, um, she made some corrections to the budget that she sent to us from the last time. Um, are there any comments, questions, answers on the budget that Lori presented? Are you guys pretty comfortable with the budget? Okay, Mark, go ahead. So I'm comfortable with the budget. I have some questions on the document that I guess you sent, um, okay, that so, on, uh, which is relates to the budget, but. Yeah, and it, it was kind of a more of a, because we never really had a, we used to have a different budgeting strategy when we were Dover board. And I think Wardsworth had a little different budgeting strategy. So I was just trying to put something together. Um, so if you want, we can review that and then come back to Lori. Lori, do you have a few more minutes if we can review those two sheets? Sure. Okay. So I did I did two things. I did this River Valley Unified School District budgeting process thoughts. And um, I just wanted to put some principles when, um, and because this is what we've been kind of following. And I think Rick, um, this is the same thing that Wardsboro had been doing pretty much in the past from what, um, from what you and I have had conversations about. So basically budgets created based on our student center decision making and taking into account the mission statement, strategic plan, most recently, and the most recently adopted equity statement that we worked on this past fall. Items previously approved by voters are included in the budget, such as the philosophy on transportation, tuition, number of buildings, and the school focus. Like, we don't ask the administration, you know, the voters have pretty much said they want to see two buildings, they want to have this transportation, um, they want to pay the, the burn Burton tuition rate. Is everybody kind of in agreement with that? Okay. Um, in the past, the boards have maintained items approved by special articles, voted affirmative by the voters, and will not deviate unless told to by the voters. 
i.e. the voters approve transportation and BUHS and the board will not remove funding for that unless the voters tell us to do that. Um, and 1B, the payment tuition for secondary students has been funded at the Burn Burt Burr Burton member district rate is approved in both towns prior to River Valleys and the budgets are created with this proposed number in the budget. However, state law does require that this number be annually approved by the voters. So the article um, to approve the Burn Burton rate, that will be what you know we present every year unless the voters tell us not to do that. And using the guidelines above, the administration presents to the board a proposed operational budget which is reviewed and discussed in open session. The board then gives preliminary approval to the proposed budget to move the process forward. And that kind of allows the next part, which is using the preliminary approved budget. Remember, we're not approving it. We're not voting to be the budget. We're just giving preliminary approval. Um, so then the business office, Lori and her group can create um, the documents and bring to the board a discussion on the implementation of the proposed budget, um, capital expenses, funding for the previous year, and what other expenses the board needs to consider to, for a presentation to the voters. The business offer, office will then review the most up-to-date information in regards to weighted average daily membership reimbursement, grants, yield, and proposed tax rates, as well as the two towns uh, common level of appraisals. The business office will then discuss this with the board with the caveat that these numbers will change and are not set until voted on by the legislature towards the end of the legislative session. The business office creates a uh, calculate the tax impact on all the choices to reflect an estimated tax rate. Um, the business office will also calculate tax impact for those who pay by income sensitivity, which I put in highlighted in yellow because that's nothing that comes out on the, the calculation form, but it's nothing we've really ever discussed in the past. Um, and at any time, the board can request change to be made to any part of the budgeting process. The reason anticipated outcomes should be explained to the board so the administration and business office understand the intent of what's being asked of them. If the administration and or business office is not sure what is being requested, then they need to clarify it before the end of the meeting. And then seven, the above steps are completed over several meetings commencing in December of each year and completed by the middle of February. The board will then vote to approve the submission of the budget to the voters through the annual meeting booklet um, that is mailed to each voting household. And then the budget will be discussed and voted on at the annual meeting. And that since the voters approve the budget to be um, an article to be discussed at the annual meeting, the budget may be amended at the annual meeting by a motion and second from the floor. Um, this allows the voters a chance to discuss changes in the budget and to change um, the budget at the time of the vote. And this is kind of what Andy was talking about, why he likes to, to you know, have the budget voted on um, from the floor. So that being said, is, is do what Mark, did you have any comments on that or was there any um, no, the, the questions I have are on the other document. Okay. So does it, is everybody good with this as a, as kind of a budgeting guideline process for the administration in the river valleys? I think it reads really well. Thank you for putting it together, Richard. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Big fan. Dwight and Kate, are you good with it? Okay. So then... With that in mind, Lori, and you know, this is kind of what Dwight, Bill, Dwight, I'm sorry, Bill, Matt, Tammy, and Lori all used. Lori met with the administration. Um, you know, Bill makes sure that they follow the, the principles and stuff, and they gave us an operational budget. Um, so I just, after uh, Rick and I usually meet with Bill to discuss the, the, um, discuss the agenda and how, you know, what's going to be on the agenda. And we were talking about budgeting stuff. So I just, I wrote this second sheet on the FY22 budget, just because I thought, um, Lori thought it was important. And I, I agree with her. I think Rick and I and Bill did that, you know, over the last year we've all, there's been a lot of changes with the budgeting. Um, you know, we've, we've fared better than a lot of other districts. 
Um, but I just thought that, you know, when you look at a $500,000 increase in secondary tuition, um, just as a simple number, you know, if you figure $15,000 is a penny on the tax rate, um, which in Dover in the past, it's been between 12 to 17, you know, a $500,000 increase represents a 33 cent tax increase specifically to Dover. I'm not as versed in Wardsboro, but there's a lot of other factors that play into including the CLA reimbursements, um, you know, what the yield is going to be. So I just remember we base our education, our decision on the operational budget based on what the recommendations are and not on what it is for taxes. The tax discussion has always come in later down the line because we're, we're not basing our decisions on what we think we can afford or what the tax rate's gonna be. We try to base our decisions on an educational, educationally sound budget. Um, and we used to have an educationally sound taxpayer friendly budget. Um, but if, the, you know, the taxes look really high, and then we've gone back and we've looked for ways to save money, or we've looked at ways to reduce that, or we've borrowed from reserve funds. And again, like um, Lori said to at one meeting a few months ago, you know, Dover and Wardsboro, between the two of us, you know, we had some pretty significant reserves, so it was always easy to borrow from. Um, pretty much the reserves have, have been dwindled down to um, nowhere near what they have in the past. You know, we, we used to be between the two schools, probably at our high mark. You know, we had over a million five in, in reserves, a million four in reserves. Um, so that also kind of brought on, if you look on the budget second look, Bill had um, put in non-negotiable investments discussion. Um, and there's just three or four different items that, you know, do add to the overall cost of the operational budget. And is this something that we want to um, have Bill look into or, um, but right now we're, we're just looking at is the operational budget a budget that everybody's comfortable with to do take care of the educational, um, our educational needs. And I think Matt and Tammy and, and Bill have felt comfortable with this, that this does meet all the educational needs. Um, and covers our mission statement and our equity statement. Is that correct, Bill? That is correct. Okay. And Matt and Tammy, you're you're good with these budget, this operational budget. Okay. So go ahead, Mark. Your question. Yeah. So on this page, um, when I first read it, I didn't know that, I, I thought it came from, from Lori originally, um, but knowing that it came from you, um, the first paragraph, um, I don't know whether you were trying to joke that we might have stepped down um, about the, because uh, of the uh, pandemic. Um, I, don't, I don't want people to think that, that if things ended up the way they, they did, that the whole board was gonna step down. Well, yeah, uh, and that that was just a lighthearted joke. Like, there's no kids in our building in the spring. You guys are bad board members. Why aren't you having the kids in school? So go away. It's a whole lot easier to hear a joke verbally than read it on paper. <laughs> um, then that the 33 cents, which you sort of um, addressed, um, just reading this, that's a very scary number. Um, so I hearing your explanation is more comforting. Um, then in the fourth paragraph down, um, this is really more of a question for Tammy and, um, and Matt, um, in regards to all the um, new students we had coming in, um, this is kind of the first real test of our residency form. Um, how did it work? Do you feel that the form worked well or needs any changes? Um, and I just bring that up because it came up in here. Mark, you kind of cut out. I didn't get everything you said. You you had a question for Matt and Tammy. Um, yeah, I'm gonna blame Consolidated. Um, can you hear me okay? Should I turn off my video? Sure. I'll turn it off. Um, so in the fourth paragraph, my question is: This was kind of the first real test of the residency form that we have that we created. Um, I'm just curious how it worked for for you 
um, for the administrators and whether there are any changes that you guys think need to be made to it. Um, it's kind of off topic, but related to what was on that form or in that letter. And that's it. So it was a little bit tricky in the beginning when the DMV was closed, um, because that's those are some of the documents that we require, like a driver's license or a car registration, but people weren't able to go to the DMV to get those. Um, so it did provide um, some obstacles, I would say, but um, you know that had to definitely do with the pandemic itself. Um, Jennifer does a lot of, you know, the collecting of all of those documents, so she can really probably speak to this a little bit better than I can. Um, but that initially, um, those are some of my thoughts. So Jen, do you, you want to maybe pipe in about the um, collection of the documents? Um, yes, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, Mark. Maybe a couple of things. I don't. I. I'm not sure if there is anything that we can do. This was a different situation um, this year um, for incoming residents of different types, um, but it, it had all the necessary documents and things for them to get. Other than the DMV being closed, that was really the obstacle that Tammy spoke about. Um, yeah, maybe some just tweaking, but nothing I can think of off the top of my head right now to do. Uh, Lori, can you, oh, go ahead, Lori. Yeah, I guess for me, what I found was a lot of these families have just moved from out of state. And one of the requirements is to have the homestead PTTR. You're not gonna have that until they have lived here for the full year of that tax year. So that is a challenge having that on there. You have to accept sort of other things that they give you um, in place of it, uh, like their deed. Um, it's when they, because some of them, you know, they just bought a house in August. They have the house. They don't necessarily have the homestead declaration. Does that make sense? So that, that can be a challenge. And that was a good question for Mark to ask. You know, Mark and, and Kate make the policy committee up and that's the policy. So I think that's something, you know, we need to kind of have you, Mark and, and Kate think about and, and bring that back to the, to the, to the board, Mark. Thank you. Mark, Matt, did you want any comment? You good? Yeah, no, I just would like to add that it was, I think it was a good exercise for Lori and I to go through. I mean, she does all the, the legwork, but we bounce the, scenarios off each other and kind of confirm, you know, really kind of work through them together. It's been really helpful to have the framework and the guardrails of that policy. And I agree with what she said about the declaration. I agree with what Jen said about the DMV. We had to be flexible around those, those pieces because we just, there was no way to get that information. But overall, I think it's a work in progress and, uh, you know, some evolution, it'll be good. Mark, just something to look into when you, you look at that policy. I think you have to, when you file, when you do the purchase through the, 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 the attorneys, there's a, a tax form you have to file with the state. And I think there's a question on this. Is this your primary residence or your secondary residence? So um, you may want to just, maybe that's something that would be an easier form because that's filed at the time of the purchase, not you know a year down the road. So are you good, Mark, then with your question? Uh, yeah, just if it's okay with Jennifer and Lori, I'm going to just give you guys a call or an email just to follow up on this so we can get this, the next evolution done. Okay, so going back to the other Lori Garland, so on the, on the operational budget expenditures, does anybody have any questions for Lori or where things are, or how, you know, where her numbers came from or any, anything along those lines? I think Lori, you you you, didn't, you just made a couple changes and you highlighted them. I think in your on that one page at the top front page, correct? Right, from draft one to draft two, the only thing I did was update our um, numbers that come from the state on the on behalf um, 
and that's really all I did at this point to the expenditure budget. So does anybody have any other questions? You guys are making it too easy. Okay, you go ahead, Mark, I'm sorry. No, I just wanna make sure that, that um, you had mentioned something about the, the list of um, items. I think it's towards the end of the budget. Um, do we wanna go through those to give um, administration uh, some guidance as whether or not we wanna look any further at those? Well, so, uh, on the operational side, there's, this, so are you talking about this page here, Mark? The one that shows on the bottom where she's got the different it, items. It, it says not, it says not in second draft. The items for discussion later in the budget. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where that is. So, can somebody it's, it's the third to last page. So what are the items? Go, Mark, can you read the items for me? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, let me pull that right back up. So um, the asphalt seal coating um, at Dover was $12,244. Um, exterior paint at Dover is 10,000. Exterior paint refinishing at Wardsboro is 10,000. The oil boiler replacement at Wardsboro was $34,670. Um, and then there is the capital, um, the, the capital needs that, I don't know if we wanna address that separately. Um, that's the roof replacement at Dover for 50,000, the tractor replacement at Dover for 10, the wood floor in the multi-use room at uh, Dover for 47,9, transportation bus, 25,000, uh, the storage shed at Dover for 10, and the classroom expansion at Wardsboro for 25,000. Okay, but those aren't operational expenses, right, Lori? Those are capital expenses? Right, they were just um, things that needed to be discussed or things you wanted to put on for discussion to potentially add to the budget at some point or not, or okay, so capital. Would, would they be added as a capital item or would they be an operational item? Um, well, the majority would be added um, at the top of the page would be added as the... Uh, annual and then you could add a line item for all of those capital needs that would then transfer to the capital fund to be funded at another time but we also have money in the or capital building fund for some of those items right the money in the capital um, was at one point designated towards the roof at dover and um, also a bus well, we, we had a we had a, a transportation we had a, a vehicle transportation a vehicle <laughs> right line item for for buying the bus and we just had a building a building line item but it was never dedicated to the roof or anything it was for building maintenance I thought okay I guess I had heard roof thrown out at one point or another but well we knew that eventually we we're gonna have to do a roof and it was gonna be a lot of money. <laughs> Okay, so I think Mark, that's not operational. So let's let's just make sure we're all good with operational first. So is everybody good with operational? And we're all set. And like, if you if it if it wasn't going to cost you anything, and the taxes weren't going to make a difference to you, everybody's okay with the operational. There's nothing that they think shouldn't be in there that should be in there that isn't. Okay. So if we have kind of preliminary approval of the operational expenditures, 
then what I'd like to do is um, is ask Lori and Bill and Matt and Tammy to go through that list that Mark read. Like this is the first I've ever heard of a shed for Dover. I thought we had three sheds or four sheds there. So I don't, you know, what are we looking for for the shed? Um, you know, obviously the there was the capital report that we had done um, when we were still in the study committee that had some recommendations and some dates that um, we should think about replacing things. There were things such as the boilers, like Matt was saying, are 25 years old. I know there was talk about an addition in the Wardsboro building. Um, so I, I think maybe for our next meeting, if we can have all those things listed out and what they actually are and whether we're trying to do them this year or not. Um, I don't know on the, the school buses and Matt, that something that um, I think is going to fall back on you because our our um, facilities and transportation persons not here. Uh, you know, do the buses need to be replaced in the next year or are they, they going to go another year? And then Lori, I think we should work on where we are with the capital budget numbers and how much we have to raise to, to cover that for the next year. Okay. Um, Whenever we're going to buy it. Because like the shed could actually come out of the capital building funds if that's a capital building project mm -hmm. but just when we go to do the roof we're going to have less money towards a roof or less money towards a boiler or less money towards an addition right 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 now you have three hundred thousand in a capital fund for the buildings or is that all the capitals that's that's all of the capital okay but some of it was assigned at last year we we made assignments of it to different so 200 for the building and then 100 for transportation. Okay. So, I mean, we've almost got the bus covered. Yeah. So if we had to buy a new bus today, we, it's not like we'd have to raise 100% of it. Right. That's okay. True. Depending on the size of the bus, I'm not sure. Okay, and, and 200,000 in the reserve for buildings would almost do the Wardsboro addition and the roof in Dover. The roof in Dover? Yeah, I thought the roof was about 100. Oh, okay. I'm not quite sure. The, so all of these lists came from that capital needs assessment. So we can take a look at that again. Okay, well, why don't, I think let's do that. Let's look at the list. Let's look at where we are for funding and how much we need to fund. The other thing, remember, folks, the idea behind a capital budget is if we need to do a roof one year and it's $100,000, we don't want to raise $100,000 in one year. We want to maybe over 10 years raise 10000 a year to kind of keep the tax rate more stable and level. And we really haven't done a whole lot of work looking at funding the capital. We funded it with reserve funds or money that was already there. So I think that's something maybe we really need to work on at, at the next couple meetings so we can get that straightened out. So if you guys are all good with the expenditure side, then Lori, I think it's you know time to look at where our, you know hopefully we have some tuition numbers are going to be out, so we'll be able to firm that line item up. Um, and we'll have, um, we should, have we got it? Go ahead. I'm sorry. So I just have a clarifying question. Uh, something that came up, I think at the last meeting we talked about, um, of, you know, how do we budget for the tuitions, the secondary tuition students and to keep with a, a um, you know, a, a methodology of doing that going forward. And I have used Burn Burton's rate for all of the students. And that's been what I've done. Now I can, because this budget is up um, quite a bit, I can go back and refigure that at the rates that we find out after uh, the 15th of January. So for example, you know, um, from the chart, you can see that the majority of students go to Brattleboro, which right now their tuition rate is 16,750, I think. So, I mean, I'm sure that will go up, but um, I can go back and refigure that. Um, but in the past, 
I have done it at the burn burden rate. So it's okay. really. So, yeah, it, in the past in Dover, we figured it where each student was going and what the rate was for that school, because that makes a big difference because tuition is, and if you just go the high number, it's okay, you know, because if you don't spend it, it's a surplus and we get it back the following year. But I think in a year where our budget's going higher, um, we really should try to budget as tightly as we can on that. So, sure, I'll go back and refigure that then. I mean, okay. for this current year, it actually worked in your favor that I did it that way because you had all the students move in, so you didn't have as much of a deficit. Um, so, I'll go back and refigure it once I have all of the announced tuition in for the uh, schools that you send students to. And Lori, even in Dover, when we vote from the floor, we would come, the board would come to the voters and make a recommendation to adjust that line item um, on the town meeting day, because it, sometimes it would change quite a bit. Um, because when we had to get the budget ready by, you know, this week or next week, we, we wouldn't get the announced tuitions. But when we went to town meeting, I would have Bill at the office just, you know, like, the day of town meeting at nine o'clock in the morning, we'd have six different color sheets of paper we can hand out to show all the different numbers. So I think it's important for this year. Okay. Rick, how did you guys in Wardsboro previously do the tuition for secondary? I think it was always done, as far as I can remember, I by where the, where the children were going to school. It wasn't just one flat number. We kind of knew where everybody was going. And, and it, it, that's a lot harder for Lori, I think, to do than when we were just doing the one school. So, mm -hmm. is, is and it is it that much of a difference if somebody goes to Leland and Gray and if they go or if they go to Burn Burton? What's the difference between the schools? I mean, we're probably talking just a few hundred dollars, right? No, th there's thousands. Well, between uh, between Burn Burton and Leland and Gray, it's only a, a very a hundred or two hundred dollars, but between uh, Brattleboro and Burton Burton, it's uh, $1,240 per student. Okay. So how many it, students it, are there? Um, well, there's 80 public school and I just, so I just did this round ball while we were sitting here uh, to see what it could, you know, pull off of the budget. Um, and it could be upwards of ninety nine thousand um, dollars, but again, I don't know what Brattleboro's going to rate is going to come in at. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Twin Valley's rate is coming in at yet. All of that, so I just have to go back. I have to wait and do that. But if I add three percent to Brattleboro's current rate, it could be somewhere you know ninety ninety nine to a hundred thousand savings. So, so I will go back and refigure that then. And also the other one that was always a big savings was uh, the people that are just getting the statewide. No, because we don't do that anymore. They all get the burn Burton rate. It used to be the statewide average tuition was quite a bit lower than what the local high schools were charging. So, mm -hmm. right. Okay. So we can sharpen our pencil on a few things and then we'll be able to look at the tax rate. So on the meeting on the 25th, um, what I'd like to do if I could, is let, let's just have it be a, a school district meeting date. So we'll get Lori in first thing to bring us up to speed on the numbers. We'll look at the capital and then we'll look at real numbers on all these projects that were asked about the, the shed and the um, whatever other other items there are. And we can start discussing them and moving that forward. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I had to find the unmute button. Um, I know originally um, you had planned on discussing the audit at the second meeting in January. Um, I just wanted to basically know whether where we are at figuring out what the surplus um, versus deficit be. Sure, Mark. Um, I did fill in those numbers, so I don't have an audit yet. Um, fiscal year 19 audit for Dover is completed. Um, and I've spoken to our, um, our audit or your auditor for fiscal year 20. And uh, we agreed on a number, um, you know, again, it's, it is round ball, but we agreed it was in the vicinity. So if you can, if you go to the next page, um, Mark, that was after the capital needs um, uh, page, 
And so this is the summary fund balance. Um, and so it's roughly around, it's going to be roughly around 260. However, $200,000 of that is set aside for fiscal year 21. But you are looking at a surplus for fiscal year 21. So, you know, I, I would think somewhere in the $100,000 range could be applied to, to revenues. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. But last year we did 200, so it would be half of last year. So remember, we artificially bought the tax rate down last year with 200,000, which, what did that cut the tax rate, Lori? Do you remember off the top of your head? I don't, I'm sorry, I'd have to go back and look. Yeah. But it was probably a good eight cents. At least because, yeah, right. Because you're, you know, you're 17 cents is, or 17,000 is right in the ballpark. So of a penny, so. Okay. Well, so that, yeah, it's, it's over 10 cents. 11.76, if that, there if it holds true. <laughs> so are we okay with everything? Then on the budget stuff, we are we okay. If we're good with that, then Lori, so we'll work to work on getting the this stuff, and then Matt and Tammy just need to get to help us with the special items in the two in the different buildings, so we know what they're all about and why we need to do it. Is that good with everybody? Bill, I get a quick question for you. So that thing I wrote the the pot the um the the policy thing or the the how we do the how the budgeting works would that be a procedure or is that a policy that would be a procedure a procedure okay so along with that bill also asked us if we instructed bill to cut the budget by a do dollar figure or we said you know based on the tax rate we want to see the tax rate reduced to this number, what would you folks have, or what, you know, Bill has a, a list of five or six things there, questions, you know, what are the sacred cows? What are the guardrails? What could not be reduced? So, you know, one of the things that we talked about was in the past, we've talked about buildings, you know, having two buildings and that's important. Um, there was a question about, um, transportation, you know, how, how sacred a cow is that? And then also single grades. Um, and there was, I think, a little confusion because in Dover, we never had single grades, only in the primary grades, K1, 3K1, 2, and 3. And then 4, 5, 6 was split up between two teachers in the past. Um, so Bill, you wanna just go over them and, and any questions you would have? Yeah, no, uh, thank you, Rich, I appreciate it. Um, the document you provided about the process, I think uh, really helps uh, both uh, Lori and I and Tammy and Matt um, when we are preparing an operational budget for you all. And I thought it was important for us to get some clarity on making sure that um, the things that you've mentioned there that you know, if voters have already included these in the budget, when we are creating a budget for you, we won't change those. And so that just brought up some thinking from me that um, I just wanted to make sure that we were approaching the budget building process uh, with complete transparency. And so things like, uh, you know, we have IB in Dover and we have STEAM in Wardsboro. And um, in my dispassionate phase, I just want to make sure that that is something the board doesn't want us to go down, that that is, that is who we are. That's part of what River Valleys is. And so we can just say we support that, we go with that, and we move on. Um, same thing with uh, having transportation outside of uh, our elementary transportation. You know, we started transportation to Brattleboro a couple years ago, and I just want to make sure that um, those are the types of things that we shouldn't be considering when we are building the budget. Uh, single grades. Um, currently in Dover, we have single grades in every grade. Um, and I just want to make sure that that is a, a, and a, that is a sacred cow. That is not something we should be looking at to combine classes. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, when we are developing the budgeting process and we are looking at the operational budget, 
um, that we are doing the uh, wishes of the board and that we are following your guidelines and your guardrails. And so um, just wanted, you know, just wanted to check in with you all to make sure that we are doing that work uh, in the way that you are expecting us to do that work. And so I just came up with those three examples just to check my thinking um, so that we're not just making assumptions. We're not just making, well, you know, it sounds like this is what you guys are for. Um, and I appreciate also a number six in the process that, uh, you know, it's incumbent on us to ask for that clarity. And uh, so I'm kind of doing that now. I wanna make sure that we are developing an operational budget that you all are directing us to, to do. And if uh, we have questions, we'll come and ask. Um, but these were some top ones, um, you know, single grades, transportation. Um, just wanna make sure that we're uh, heading in the right direction. So just a couple quick comments for me and then anybody else. So single grades for classrooms in the Dover building, I don't believe has ever been something brought up to the voters or discussed. And, and actually the plan we presented many, many years ago was single grades in the lower levels in the primary. And then we, we did have combined grades, but when the numbers increased, it made sense. And then with the um, additional burden of IB, transportation has been approved by the voters as far as I know, because that's something we've given them in the school focus, both the IB and the STEAM have been, I think, both approved and confirmed by the voters because, you know, to do the IB, we had to bring it to the voters and we brought the focus, the two building focus to the voters in River Valley's early days. And that's how we came up with the IB, uh, with the STEAM for the Wardsboro building. So unless somebody thinks differently, I, I think those are kind of voter items. Um, Rich, could I just ask, ask for a, a quick moment of clarity? Um, on, the, on the single grades, um, uh, what I heard you say is that uh, the voters have approved uh, K through three in the Dover building being single grades, but four, five, and six could be combined, but that must be considered under the implementation of the International Baccalaureate Program. Yeah, the voters never approved the configuration. We in Dover sold it that, you know, the primary focus was on the primary grades and the single grades in there, along with the addition of the preschool and full day kindergarten. But that was only Dover. That was never a River Valley's. Thing. Okay. Then we've never approved it. And, but we always had the combined four, five, and six previous to that until the numbers got too big. Okay, so I guess I would ask from the board clarification uh, since it hasn't been in front of the, uh, the voters, um, is uh, you know, a single grade configuration in Dover a sacred cow? Is it something that should be considered as we're developing a budget or is it not something we should consider when developing a budget? So Mark has his hand up first. So um, question then comment. Um, Rich, you brought up um, the, well, both of you, um, Bill and Rick, um, the idea of um, IB and single grade classrooms. Um, is that a requirement of IB in, in their primary program? Um, since I have been separated from the day-to-day -day operations of IB, I think I'd ask Matt if he wants to um, give us a little bit more detail on that. So it's not my understanding, Mark, that it's a requirement of IB, but there are, we've tried to seek out school models that have combined grades with IB and they are extremely rare, um, mostly because the program is, for each grade is really unique. So. Uh, to be able to run that in a combined grade environment is extremely challenging and would take a, you know, it would, it would be very difficult. So the, those, those um, uh, cases of those schools are, are very hard to find. And I think it was a recommendation of our two people, the two IB coordinators from the IB program back, Bill, when you were still there, that, that it doesn't work as well with single uh, do combine grades as it does with single grades, but 
No, I believe uh, that is uh, a correct recollection that it is, uh, it is an extra uh, challenge uh, when they are, go beyond a single grade. Mark, your comment? Um, so um, I, to me, the single grade would be, a, um, how do you phrase it? Not cash cow, but sacred, sacred cow, sacred, a sacred cow um, for um, the reason of, um, of IB, but also I think running two elementary schools in the district, um, it gives families um, an option if they want um, for school choice, if they want their kids to be in, in a grade, you know, single classroom grade, or if they prefer multi-grade classrooms. Um, so I think giving uh, the, the district members the choice is, is, is important and we can do it. Any other comments from any other people? Richard. Yes, Laura. <clears throat> I apologize. Bill, did you say IB and STEAM as like your part of your three things or? Uh, yeah, I'm just confirming that IB and STEAM are um, things that the voters have uh, voted on multiple times and support. And that is not something that we should um, consider uh, adjusting as we prepare a budget uh, to deliver to the board for consideration. Mm -hmm. You know, just as a follow up to that for the board too, and, and I think this goes back to like what Andy was, McLean was saying earlier. So if we do an actual meeting and, and we have this budget and it shows a tax rate increase of a thousand dollars of a thousand and we present this operational budget and somebody can stand up at town meeting and say hey look you know I'm okay with the, this budget going up quite a bit but um, I tell you I don't think the IB is worth it so they can make a motion and they can question the board and say roughly how much of this budget is cause is because of IB and we could say, you know, we would say, hey, around 20,000 here and a thousand there. So it's $45,000 and they can make a motion to reduce the budget by $45,000. Um, and then there gets to be discussion about it and people can say, hey, you know, the IB is the greatest thing since sliced bread and other people can say, well, it's not that great and I want it to go away. And then you, you get to vote on it. And then that would be the new direction that, that we would take as a board. Um, it's the same thing like with, um, so I, I would never advocate us taking it out as a board because people have wanted it in the past, but if the voters don't think it's that important, then they will let us know. The other thing is this whole budgeting process is not done in a, you know, back room and back door and in, in silence. I mean, we, we have meetings, we post the budget, it's part of a, it's a public document. So if we had, you know, a hundred people come out and say to us, hey, we think transportation is crazy and we should stop doing any transportation, you know, that would be something that we would be hearing. But I don't think we've heard anything yet from anybody. And, and Matt and Tammy, you guys front line are probably the closest to hearing anything of anybody, um, you know, I think everybody, um, you know, feels like the programs we're presenting are, are valuable programs and, and they're worth having. So, um, so I think again, you know, um, all we're doing is kind of setting something to present to the voters and let them decide and tell us what they think, you know, at the meeting. Which again, I've always said is in, in the, again, you know, I don't want everybody to think I'm just trying to uh, suck up to Andy, but. You know, it's it's definitely I, I do like the floor vote because it tells us, you know, what's going on. People may vote down a budget because it's too low and it didn't include things they wanted or but you don't know that because you don't get to have that conversation. All they do is they, they make a mark on a ballot and then we have to try to be mind readers. And if I was a mind reader, I, again, I wouldn't be here. Andy, did you want to comment or Mark has his hand up? Uh, no, I wasn't going to comment, but you can suck up to me anytime you want, you know, that that's, that's legit. Okay. Go ahead, Mark. I, I was just going to say that, um, 
the the comment I made earlier when when Andy was was presenting um, in regards to um, a, a Australian ballot meeting was purely because it's a COVID year, um, and and I absolutely believe that the the board made a decision before I was on it that that the budget would be voted on at, at on the floor, and I think that that's absolutely the way to go. Um, so this my comment was purely a this year. Um, comment. No, and I think we all understand that. And that's why in that first paragraph, Mark, is, you know, how strange a year it is in, in yeah. that, about the F22 budget, you know. So if we're all good, then, Lori, I think, and Bill and, and Matt and Tammy, you're, you're okay with our marching orders? Yeah, I feel like um, I am comfortable um, working with my colleagues and how we have uh, gone about uh, developing the operational budget. And I appreciate you guys uh, making some clarifications that uh, is very helpful. And I would just, again, uh, very much appreciate the uh, procedure and our role in it because um, we wanna be as transparent as possible and deliver what it is the board is asking us to deliver. So thank you guys all very much. Okay, go ahead, Mark. Um, so, one, I want to thank you guys for all the hard work that you've done on, on the budget. Um, that's not an easy task. Um, and I think you guys did a great job. Um, another comment is that um, I think it would be good for the board, um, probably annually, just to kind of take a look at those guardrails, not necessarily these, but um, the, the, the board had set up some guardrails um, early on for the district. Um, I think it's probably a good idea for us to look at those um, on a regular basis. Um, to help the administration out when doing their budget. Yeah, and I, I think, Mark, what I'd like to do is, is review that thing I wrote up and not now, because if you guys are all good with it, but at a, a future meeting, kind of approve that as the, the um, budgeting strategy to, to task our administrators with in the future. If we do that, I would just ask you to change the RVUUSD to the RVUSD instead. Yeah, and I don't, remember, I'm, I'm not a wordsmith, and I barely got through Leland and Grace, you know, J.B. Stearns' English class, so um, it's not easy for me sometimes. So we'll work on it as a group and get it straight. You don't, you don't give yourself enough credit there, Rich. Yeah, well, I, I'm struggled, believe me. Okay, if, we got, if you guys are all good, then, Lori, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry we held you so long, um, but if you want to take off, thank you very much. Mark and um, Kate, I think these policies have all been, um, they were all voted to um, post. So can we, if, if there's no questions or comments, we could probably um, a, vote to adopt the three of these as a group if nobody objects to that. Without objection, I'll make that a motion. Okay. So Mark is moving the policy C50, age of admission students, pre-K and kindergarten, B50, B20, personal re personnel recruitment, selection appointment and background checks, and F25 access control be adopted as posted. And Matt and Tammy, they've both been posted in your buildings, correct? So I have a second to Mark's motion. Kate will second. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Mark, you go first. Nope, happy to answer any questions, but I think they speak for themselves. Kate, you all set? I'm all set. I think we discussed them pretty well last week or two weeks ago, okay. three weeks ago. Are you then anybody else? You're all ready to vote? You're all ready to vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 It appears as though it's a unanimous eyes. It is unanimous. So Peter, I'm sorry, I forgot to check with you, but you're good on that motion and everything. Okay, so that adopted. Um, our, let's set our next meeting, which is going to be January 25th at six o'clock. Is that good with everybody? And since that's off our regular meeting night, can somebody just make that a motion, please? So I moved. motion. Okay, Kate moves. Awesome. Mark, you're going to get the second. Ladies first this time. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. It appears as though the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, we do have a quick executive session on two items. Um, so if I could entertain a motion to move into executive session. I'll move, we move into executive session for legal and student issue. Uh, Rich, okay. do you need uh, Tammy and Matt to stay or can they go? Um, unless you want them on the student issue, Bill. No, nah, I've got it covered. Okay, thank you, Matt and Tammy. Thank you, Matt and Tammy. Good night, guys. Thank you. Have a good night, good guys. Night. Mark, Matt, outstanding job today, brother. Thank you for the support. Couldn't do it without you. Keep it up, Matt. Hey, Matt, Matt thank you, guys. So Mark moved, do I have a second? Eight seconds. Okay, Mark moved, Kate second to move in executive session for legal and student issue. Um, Peter and Brattleboro TV, I gotta kick you guys for a minute. Well, so stay around, okay. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna be very long now. Mark, I transferred uh, hosting to you because I was getting unstable. So you'll probably want to pause the recording. Okay. Uh, as soon as we vote on the um, yeah. motion. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Here's all the ayes aye. have it. Here's all the ayes have it. The ayes have it. We're in executive session, Mark. By unanimous consent, we came out of executive session at 9 p.m. Um, they voted to make me benevolent dictator for life. So oh, it's been waiting so long. Yeah. Been. So, anyways, tight vote. So here we go, guys. It was a tight vote. <laughs> um, I had a promise of chicken in every pot. <laughs> On the student issue, um, Bill left the executive session approximately 8:50. And um, he updated us on the student issue, and there's no further comment on that. And then on the legal issue, Rick and myself will keep the board informed um, and discuss it at the next, hopefully at the next meeting, we'll have some answers on where we're headed. Is that good with everybody? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank so, you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Thank Thanks, you Rich. Thanks, Peter. Or make a motion. So I move adjourned. Dwight seconds it. All Second. those people say aye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Good night, all. Nice. See you guys in two Thank weeks. You. See you in two weeks. <laughs>